Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sometimes the best gifts are worth waiting for. And we see this already on, on day six of creation, when God creates Adam. And interestingly, God creates Adam alone and, and waits for Adam to recognize that something is missing in God's perfect creation. That even though he lives in God's paradise, that paradise is incomplete without someone to share it with. And it's only after Adam comes to this realization that God creates Eve. And here God performs the first marriage ceremony. God walks his daughter Eve down the aisle and presents her to Adam. And Adam says, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Here God not only creates Adam and Eve, male and female, gives them to each other, but the God who created marriage reminds us today that marriage is sacred. The words for our meditation today are recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 18. I invite you to stand as we read these words in Jesus' name. You shall not commit adultery. We bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, these are your words. We pray that you make us holy by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Please be seated. We're told in the Bible that Jonathan loved David more than he loved himself. In, for, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, we're told that after Jonathan died, David mourns for the loss of his friend, saying, Your love, Jonathan, was more dear to me than the love of a woman. We look at those verses. People often ask today, doesn't that mean that, that Jonathan and David were actually gay? The answer to that is, is no. But the fact that our minds immediately jump to that conclusion, the second we hear that David and Jonathan loved each other, the, the fact that we jump to that conclusion right away tells us something about how our culture understands sex. Our culture today understands or thinks of sex equals love. Or love equals sex. Sorry, I said that the other way around. If you love someone, then that gives you every right to have sexual intimacy with them or to enter into a sexual relationship. So if a, a man loves a man or a woman loves a woman or a man loves a woman, it doesn't matter as long as they love each other what our world tells us today. Is that really true, though? Think of, think of a lady trying to justify their relationship by saying, but he loves me. Well, he also loves Sunday football. He also loves working on cars, and he loves Buffalo Wild Wings. Love is such a broad word. How do you know when he says he loves you and you think you love him back that you mean the same thing? Does it really work to justify the relationship on the word love? Or for instance, someone will say, well, how can God forbid my love? God doesn't forbid love. An example of David and Jonathan in the Bible is a perfect example of that. What God forbids is lust. 
Lust is desiring someone that you either cannot be married to or are not married to. And so acting on that lust, either in our thoughts or in our actions, is where the word adultery comes from. Is love the foundation for a sexual relationship? Well, the Bible's answer to that is a resounding no. God makes it very cut and dry, very, very simple. The foundation for intimacy is marriage. The Bible gives us a very clear definition. One man and one woman united for life. And God's purpose here is because his, his gift of sexuality is such a wonderful blessing, he protects it with the safety and the trust and the commitment that husband and wife share for each other in the marriage relationship. And so often today when people complain about the LGBTQ community destroying marriage or destroying how we think of sexuality, we have to be honest and recognize that it was Christian heterosexuals who first destroyed God's definition of love and marriage. It was Christian heterosexuals who were attempting to justify their relationship by saying, He loves me. Or by treating marriage as nothing more than just a rubber stamp that we can enter into lightly and exit out of quickly when things get difficult. But honestly, there are issues that are a lot closer to home that I want to talk about today in regard to the Sixth Commandment. And now that I'm kind of like halfway through this, I want to just call out the, the absolute awkwardness of listening to a pastor talk about sex in church. It makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? We're not used to it. We don't like it. Um, and it's probably the last place you would be sitting next to your parents during a conversation. Why is that? You know, it's interesting that in the church, we have surrounded the topic of sex with a cloud of shame. And that's our fault as, as pastors when, when we only treat sex as a bad word or a dirty word or something bad. And it's really easy for us to rant against the evils of sex. And... Uh, we, what, we, what we do is we turn it into a dirty word. You can't hear the word sex without the sin alarms going off in our minds. And that's not the way God wants us to treat this gift of his. At the same time in the homes, you know, uh, in our, there's nothing we're exposed to more often than sexuality. It's in our commercials. It's in our uh, uh, journals, TVs, it's books everywhere. It's everywhere. But it's one topic we're afraid to talk about at home. And I don't know who is more afraid of the talk, the kids or the parents. Sex is a blessing from God. God created us male and female. There's nothing to be ashamed about in our anatomy or that gift that God has given us, that not, not only to enjoy, but that God wants us to enjoy, and that's why he gave it to us. It's, it's a wonderful, beautiful blessing, and, and God loves it so much and wants you to enjoy it so much, he protects it with, with marriage. You know, that the Old Testament word, sometimes you, you see that in those old Bible translations that so-and-so knew their wife. Knowing someone was, was the, the Bible's, the, the Hebrew's euphemism for sexual intimacy in a marriage. Because it's the deepest, most wonderful expression of, of physical, emotional, you could even say spiritual intimacy that we can share in this life. One of the encouragements I have personally appreciated is is um, an encouragement to, to never make sex a shameful topic. To always be open to talking about it and even start that conversation at a young age so that kids always feel comfortable coming to you and talking to you about that topic. And why that's important.
important is because it's important to fight against shame. It's, in, it's important to fight against that cloud of shame that surrounds the entire topic in the church and in the home. And what shame is, is shame is a deep sense of self-loathing. Something is wrong with me. And shame makes us afraid to talk about certain things or afraid to ask about certain things because we think that I'm the only one who's wondering about this or I'm the only one who wants to talk about this or, or has this problem or needs to ask this question. And oftentimes that's not true. But what shame does is it makes us afraid to talk to other people about it because if we talk about it, if we broach a subject, then we're afraid that they're going to look at me a different way and they're not going to love me the same way. And why it's important to fight against shame is because the devil loves shame. The devil loves when we keep whole topics in the dark because the devil is a cockroach at heart. He breeds in the dark. He's at home in the dark and he can spread his lies in the dark. One of his lies about sex today is he likes to put it on a pedestal. Um, you know, we see this in our culture, making this um, either the act of sex or what a person's body ought to look like on such a pedestal that reality can never reach the fantasy. And when reality disappoints, it drives people away from each other seeking after a fantasy. Or maybe because sex is on such a pedestal today, people constantly are given the message that if I'm not in a relationship, if, if there isn't someone in my life like that, then, then my life is, is meaningless. And those people carry, again, a sense of self-loathing, a sense of shame because my life isn't measuring up to other people. Young adults give themselves away because that's what society tells them they need to do to find fulfillment. And when they do that, then all of a sudden sex becomes not something on a pedestal, but something that's very cheap. It leaves them feeling empty, broken. And so oftentimes that's the lie of shame, is that no one can love me for who I am. I'm all alone. No one else sees me. No one else understands me. That's why it's so important that when the Bible talks about love, and more importantly, God's love for us, he loves, God loves to use the picture of a marriage to describe his love for you. And the reason being is that that way we can understand what true love really is. Our love and love in this world always disappoints and always fails, and we can never reach up to that, but, but God's love is perfect. We see what true love is because it's based on commitment. God tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, let's see, where did my sermon go here? God tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 um, that Christ, he, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, it says, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his good will. His love is based on commitment. We look at the things that have happened to us in life or the things that we've done in life and think God could never love me for that. But instead, what, what this says is God saw you before the creation of the world and God loved you and God chose you to be his own. There's nothing to be ashamed about. Or when we think of true love, true love is shown in action. In Romans chapter 5, we're told that God demonstrates his own love to us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We spend so much of our life trying to convince ourselves that I have to, do, I have to be something or I have to do something in order to be worthy of God's love. And here what God says, while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. God wasn't waiting for us to change. He sent his son Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners. And finally, true love is... True love doesn't find fulfillment in seeking to be fulfilled by others. True love finds fulfillment in fulfilling someone else's deepest need. Listen to how God describes this. That Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. That's personal love. Love that comes to us. And so often we, we think that God's love is this distant love from heaven, but this is describing God's personal love for you, that he expresses to you in baptism, that, that he... Sh He's sealed you as his own. He's washed you with that water. He's washed away your sins and anything that we thought defiled our souls. And he gives you his eternal pledge. You are mine. See, this love is, is, is the death of shame because it is the love that sent Jesus to die on the cross. Jesus understands shame. He died in shame on the cross. And he wasn't afraid to face it for you and for me. That means he's never afraid of you or me. It's his love for you that washes us clean in our baptism, that washes you in the Lord's Supper, and makes you his own dear child. And nothing, nothing can take away the meaning or the purpose that love gives you. So it's true that sometimes the best things in life are worth waiting for. God taught that lesson to Adam by having him wait just a moment in paradise to be united with Eve. But in a broader sense, God is showing us a little piece of his own heart. God is showing us that even in paradise, even though God lived perfectly in eternity, something was missing. The picture wasn't complete until he created you and I. God wanted to share his paradise, his heaven, with you and me. That's why he created us, that's why he redeemed us, and that's why he's put us in worldly relationships. As husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, friends. Is that by being faithful to one another, we can see each other safely to heaven. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus.